in that song, we just, we just sing. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of overwhelmed by it, aren't you? Overwhelmed by our God and the fact that for some reason he gives us frail human beings absorbing this oxygen out here he created. He gives us the privilege of somehow jumping into what he's doing. And we get to somehow, through the Spirit's power, get those small glimpses. And it's all him. And, and then, and then the, the, the line about that death's losing its grip. Oh, the work was done at the cross, but it, it seems like when we look at the sin-ravaged planet around us, it, it, death's still trying. I don't know about you, but in the last couple of years, I've been starting to have a little grip issues. And let me tell you, it's frustrating when suddenly you're asking your 14-year-old to open the jar of pickles. And I'm thinking, as this frail human being, how frustrating it is for me when I can't get that grip. And I, I, and I got to think of the enemy <laughs> who's losing good grip. He's already lost. The victory's already been won. But when you look around this room, when you're hearing these stories, you're hearing about this grip. It's being lost in different places all over this state, this region, this planet through the power of the only one who can do anything about it. And he, and he lets us be involved in it. You know, listening to John, I wish Monica and the boys were here. Listen to John up here speak. You know, uh, it was several years back when we came up with this crazy idea that we were going to move with our boys over to Africa. And John and Monica were one of the first ones who started writing and said, you know, we want to be a part of that with you all. I'm like, great. Who are you guys again? <laughs> we couldn't remember. And then we met up with them like, oh, because, and our heart, here in their heart when believers get together, right? And then I remember a few years later when, when John calls up, I think we're going to go overseas. I'm like, you're going to what? That's awesome. With all your boys? Yeah, with all our boys. I don't know what's going to happen, but we're just going to follow what God's leading us to do. And that's an exciting place because every time someone says, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what that next step looks like. I'm just going to do it. There's that grip. It's loosening to the power of Jesus Christ. Church of Rock family, we are thrilled to be back with you. I'm here with my amazing wife. We are in our 26th year of our honeymoon. Um, so my wife, Esther, who is spectacular with me now, you know, as we get older, we, we come here with less children each time. We're down to just one child with us here. So we have a spectacular 14-year-old Josiah with us here today. He's rocking the house, which we're thrilled about. Um, but, you know, there's, there's different things with getting older. Matter of fact, i got to confess something right now. Um, this is, this is, I got a new Bible. I'm really excited about it because I learned something. You know, uh, eight or 10 years ago, when I turned 40, I found out that need for that extra thing with the Bible called large print. <laughs> hey, hey, look what I found. This is called giant print. <laughs> you know, when my wife said, ordering, but she goes, why are you ordering a Bible? She, uh, I go, they have a, something called giant print. That's exciting. That's exciting. So I've got, I've got my, my new giant print Bible. Um, and so, you know, as, as we get to open the word today, I love this. I love getting to open the word. I want to need your help, though. We're going to separate you all into three sections so I don't get thrown off course. I get a little too excited and just start want roaming somewhere. So you, this side over here, you're going to be one team for me, all right? All right, you got it? So when I point to you, I want you all to say, look forward, okay? It's not very hard. You gotta say with enthusiasm, really mean it. Really, let's try it. Look Good start. You guys are open, and wow, well, you guys are in front of me, so it's stuck with just you all right here, okay? So your phrase, when I point to you, is gonna be what? It's on the board. It's gonna be open your eyes. You ready? Let's try it. Open your eyes. So you guys are. Look you guys are. Open your eyes. Hey, 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 they're doing good. Ready to show off over here? All right. Because you guys get to jump in, okay? Now, this better have some enthusiasm, you know? I mean, to jump in, right? So let's try it. And we're to get to you, but I want you guys to show off here at the end. Ready? Let's try it. Look forward. Open your eyes. Jump in. Woo, all right. They're ready to go. Oh, man, that is great. Okay, so hang on to that. When I point to you, you know your role to keep us on track, to keep us going through tonight. You know, because... Uh, we live in a planet, I think I put on a stat, 7.8 billion, just about a week or so ago, we crossed 7.9 billion people living on this planet currently. And what has to break our heart 
is the fact that about 3.2 billion of those live within a socio-political geography where they are largely cut off from access to the gospel. We give our little terminology, unreached people groups, and people who know us know that is our heartbeat, that is our target, is to get into those unreached people groups and plant churches with near tribe, similar language family armies of indigenous missionaries. And through partnerships like yours, we are seeing God just blow open some of these doors. Um, let me give you just a couple of examples. Here's what God does. We do a lot of planning and, and preparing. If people, you know me, you can look, I've probably got my 36-month calendar out, you know, for like coffee meetings. I'm just, we plan and we prepare, but then here's what happens. We get to this certain point, and just before we think we're ready, God just goes, bam, okay, let's run. Because he's been orchestrating behind the scenes all of his work, which is really what matters, right? And here's what happens time and time again. We do this work, we get planning into this, uh, as we have these different people groups that we work with, and then God just lays at our feet in an amazing supernatural way, this cultural liaison that connects us with this people group that before would have nothing to do with outsiders, certainly no one who's a Christian. God gives us a connection, and then it just grows exponentially so quick. Let me give you a few examples. Give me the next picture, please. Like this is uh, this here, oh, this is out in the North Kivu area. If you follow Congo News, I know you all do, but if you follow Congo News, North Kivu, Kasese, that whole region over there, it's in the news a lot because of it's just a, a one issue after another. Churches being burned, people being killed, Lardis Ebola outbreaks in the middle of wars, um, UN workers getting killed trying to give uh, help in Ebola situations. In that region alone, there are over 115 active militia groups. It's just chaos in that area. And as they're burning churches, as these militia groups are coming through and doing all these different things, what is God doing? I tell you, this is our one school campus. We can't keep putting up enough buildings because there are so many people trying to get in so they can share the word of God with more and more people. It is our fastest church plant area right there in the middle where the news will tell you this is disaster. Death has a grip here. I'm telling you that death does not have a grip there because there's a church that's alive and well through your partnership and guys like these that are going out sharing the gospel. I'm leaving there. I don't know. It's June, July this year. I'm trying to, to hop on. Uh, there was all these checkpoints everywhere, so we just rented planes and flew over them all. Um, so I'm trying to get back to the airstrip, and I keep getting these calls. You've got you to wait. There's another tribe trying to get across the mountain, across from the Congo out to our, our landing strip, because they've got to meet you, and they're just begging, one more place, one more place. We've got to get more people in. We've got to get another building built. We've got to get more teachers there so that the gospel can spread across those regions. That's just one area. What's the next one I have up there? Next picture, the Menin people, unreached people group, 37,000 of them. Amazing what God is doing among this people group right here. You guys have been praying and giving for this people group very particularly. Now we have five churches within this people group, and we now have our first three Menin people. It's a three-year program we take them through. We don't just say, here's your week program, you're a pastor. There's a long process that we take them through, and then they go out for their people group and the next people group to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's the next one? Let's go on. Um, on the Middle East, the Holy Spirit is moving across the Middle East. Um, uh, uh, obviously, we can't show you who these people are, but they're your brothers, sisters in Christ, who risk a lot to do something crazy like get baptized and let other people know that they trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Holy Spirit's moving over there like wildfire. Next one. Let me give you another one here. Um, the, this, are, this is the newbie people. This was some of you follow us. This is the last year or so been working towards this group. Actually, this scene right here, this is just a couple of months ago. Finally got in, had enough agreements with this people group. This people group is listed as 100% Muslim. You know, most people groups are like 99% this, 99 or something. There is no known non-Sunni in this group, complete uh, Muslim group. God supernaturally, I'm telling you, just like in all these other words, he has provided a person, open up the floodgates, and suddenly things are just happening everywhere. Next picture you see is sharing the gospel there. These are with clan leaders. That one picture, I'm there with the head newbie chief. And he's like, I don't understand why last December, Allah told me to wait until the outsider comes to help our people. You are finally here. Let me tell, let me, let me tell you about God. 
Let me tell you about Jesus. And this last picture here in this people group is our school that's ongoing right now. Just opened about a month and a half ago. We already run double classes. It's packed out as far as you can go, 42 students there. Um, uh, just two weeks ago, got our first two wells dug inside Newby Villages. Why? Because some reason, you know, God said, okay, here's your connection. Here's your connection. And now I just want to, I just want to make it big. And I just, I just want to show off. But not here. Next picture, please. It hasn't happened like this here. See, one of our people groups trying to get into is the Nanyika tribe in uh, northwestern Mozambique. We've been in and out of this area for about three years. And, and so, and we keep, the, we keep being like on the edge of this huge thing to happen because here's what we do. We could, okay, God, remember God, here's what you did here. Here's how it worked. Okay, now we've set it up for you, God. Now go. <laughs> and it hasn't happened. So, oh, let's take a tip. Let's go face before God. God, let me remind you, this is how you work. Here's what you did here and here and here. Okay, now go. <laughs> and we've seen multiple, you know, churches planted. We haven't seen a movement yet. Haven't got that breakthrough yet that we're praying for. Let me tell you, it's very, very easy for someone like me to get so frustrated. Why? Because I get fixated on the form rather than simply rejoicing in the faith that he's given us. I get so fixated on the method that he has chosen to work in the past that I, that I miss sight on what the maker is doing today and tomorrow. You see, sometimes we look back and we say, I'm getting tied down because this horrible thing in my past, but sometimes I'm telling you, it's because of the amazing way he's worked in the past and we're so fixated on, here's the method, here's the way you work, God. Oh, I, don't, I don't want to look over there yet because I really want to bask in it right here. You know, that's where we find the conference verse we have, Isaiah chapter 43. I want to invite you to look at those verses right now. In Isaiah chapter 43, we have, uh, we have a context where Isaiah is writing prophecy. What he is writing, he is writing about events that are going to happen 100 and 200 and even farther years out from when he's writing this. And he's writing to these people and he's reminding them of some of the great things God has done and then how they messed up. And because they messed up, they're going to be taken off into captivity. And he's going through, he's, and he reminds them of a couple of big events. It, just before the main verses here, uh, he, he, talks about, he talks about the great Red Sea event, okay? It's a pretty common event. We all remember what happened, right? God, through his amazing miracles, convinced Pharaoh it's time to get rid of these people, Right? They're finally leaving, and then they get in front of that huge, massive body of water, and they're stuck. And we know the story. Pharaoh's army said, okay, I want them back. So now you have this civilian refugee mob of people stuck between one of the mightiest armies of the ancient period and the sea, this huge barrier of water. And so in the verses leading up to this, He's saying, do you remember that? Do you remember what God did? Remember when all the chips were down? God came through and he broke through that barrier of water and he saved you. And then right after that, we read verse 18 and it says, but forget all that. <laughs> now, how does that even make sense? But that's how verse 18 starts. But forget all that. But, but how does verse 18 end? Because it is nothing compared to what I'm about to do. So the first thing he says is, you ready? You guys ready? First thing he says is, look forward. Thank you, front row. Are you guys awake back there? <laughs> Let's try it again. So the first thing he says is to, look forward. there you go. He says, look forward. Don't be so fixated on exactly how something happened in the past that you miss out on what God is doing in the future. You know, um, this, this happened to me at, at one point, uh, one point like daily. Um, <laughs> but so, a time very specifically I'm thinking about is, you know, our, our, main, our main role is we pray that God leads us so that we can handpick the best leaders um, that we can get. Because we want to train, we want to disciple, we want to pour into those that are bold, hard workers and going to risk life and limb to cross over into the next tribe and form this army of crossing into these different tribes. Well, one time I'm in Central Africa and I'm with some of my guys and I'm teaching at a, at a prison 
we have a lot of prison ministry, and, and uh, this female warden from a female prison um, comes in. He goes, I need, I need to meet with you. So I met with her, and she goes, I want, I want you to tour our facility. And I said, well, okay, oh, sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah, I hear you're a believer, and you like what's going on. I understand that. And so she was the head warden in the maximum security prison in this particular country. Over 90% of her inmates will never get out. Um, it is, it's the highest level prison there. And um, so I'm like, wow, you know, this is, this is just amazing what's going on. Well, uh, I'm spiritual, so I told her, I'll pray for you, you know. Um, so we did the whole routine, and then she goes, now I need to show you something else. And then she walked me into this room right here. Show the next picture, please. She walked me into a room filled with babies and toddlers and children up to about age five. She goes, uh, um, these are children that were all born here in this building, They've lived their entire lives here in this building. They've never had any interaction with anyone outside of this building. You can see I come in and take a picture, and they're a little terrified of this guy coming in because no one's really allowed in there. Um, Just so many women, when they're convicted, they're pregnant. They come into the prison system. Their babies have to be born there. They stay there in the cell. Now, the women are not given any extra things to care for the child. Whatever meager, and they are very meager, horrible little rations they get in there, that's what has to sustain the child. No outside contact. And I remember at that moment thinking, whew, wow. And then that's when God starts giving you that nudge. Oh, that's a dangerous place when that starts happening. So what did I do? Well, I reminded God of what I was doing. (laughs) Now, God, you remember what you and I do. Okay, um, we train men, jungle conquering church planners. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> and it's always like God said, are you done? Because here's what I'm doing. Do you want to come along? I don't know about you. It's terrifying when you get that from God, but I got to jump in. You, you've, you've got, if he's gone somewhere, I want to be there. I want to jump into what he's doing. I, don't have, I could spend the next hour talking to you about what has happened through that ministry, tying local slum churches to have weekly visitation rights into that program, through partners like you, programs that are now going on inside for those children, for those ladies, now building chapels at these different prisons. We just got a, a whole cow project kind of thing going in this particular prison right there for those women and for those children. So that just this summer when I was there um, visiting the, the next level up now for the system is saying, now we see what you're doing here. What are you going to do here? I know what I feel like saying, God, <laughs> la, 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 la. I almost missed what he was doing. And, I, and I'm not foolish enough to think it's dependent on me. He was going to do something there in that prison. But he invited us, your partner with us, he invited us to walk into what he was doing. And we got the privilege of that. Why is it so difficult then? Why, why is it so difficult for us to, 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 to look forward? Well, I got a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because, well, we, we like living in yesterday's comfort zones. And what we got to realize is that, you know, comfort zones don't always pay the same dividends as you go through life. You know, there's especially when there's those times where God has come to your rescue. He's given you that sweet moment in your journey, and it was so sweet, you just want to stay there. And he's like, no, no, that, that moment's over. It's time to move on. He goes, but I just like this moment. It's from you. It's me and you, and I like this moment. I mean, what? P- Peter did that, right? Remember? I mean, before he met Christ, right? He was, he was a fisherman. It was who he was. Christ called him in, but then after the resurrection and, and his life being turned upside down, didn't know what was going on, where do we find Peter? Going back to his only go-to therapy, he knew, this is who I am. And we find him not being too successful out there until what? Jesus calls for him. And the fish are coming in, and he goes, I want to be there. I, I don't want to be in this boat I, I want to be there. I want to be where Jesus is at. And you know the story. He jumps, he swims over, and Jesus is there on the beach, and he's making shrimp and grits. And Sorry, I'm from the south. He's, he's grilling fish. He is already preparing for Peter's 
next stage. Is that, that comfort zone there? That was a great comfort zone for you. But we're moving this way. But not only that, but sometimes we get stuck in, I can't think of anything else other than call it Care Bear Christianity, right? And it's like this, you know what? If God's really calling me to something, I remember last time God called me to something and I got all these warm fuzzies inside. And it was like I had this big rainbow gushing out of my chest. You know, and right now, some of the things I'm hearing around this room or hearing God speak to me through his word, it doesn't sound all warm and fuzzy, so it must not be God. He has called us to impact for eternity, a sin-ravaged planet. And there's a very high possibility, probability, shall we say, that where he's taking you in life is going to be more sweat and tears and a little bit less rainbows and lattes. So he tells us to do what? He says, first of all, (laughs) I'm so glad this place is saving you all. (laughs) All right, so they are here to look forward, but we're not going to stop there because next he says, you guys are ready. All right, you guys stay bored for a while, sorry. Those were just not there. Okay, so let's go back to the text, Isaiah 43, verse 18. But forget all that, it is nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I am going to do something new, okay? He says, I am going to do something new. So first of all, okay, don't focus in on the past method. Be looking around, have your eyes open, because I am going to be doing something new. Who is doing something new? Who is the action maker? It's, this is, I know you said, well, that's a dumb question. No, it's not. If it's so dumb, then why do our lives get hung up on it all the time? There's so many times we don't step forward because we think it depends on us. I'm telling you, who is the action maker? It's got, let's, you know, if you were just to peruse this one chapter, just, ver, just chapter 43, Let's see what chapter 43 gives us about who is the action maker in chapter 43. In verse 1, I have ransomed you. Actually, we can't even get out of verse 1. Another verse 1, I have called you by name. Verse 2, I will be with you. Verse 3, I am the... I'm getting tired of saying it. I'm just going to raise my hand. You say I. Let's try it. There you go. Let's try it. Verse 3, I am the Lord. Verse 3, Gave you, verse four, I love you. Getting tired of it yet? I'm not. Let's keep reading. Verse five, am with you. Verse six, will say. Verse seven, have made. Verse seven again, it just keeps going. Verse 12, predicted your rescue. Saved you. Verse 14, will send an army. Verse 16, yeah, can keep going. Do you think he's trying to tell us something? It's almost like he's sovereign or something. It's almost like he's saying, I've got this. Okay, so this whole chapter says, I, God says, I am the action maker. How foolish it must seem then when we come reluctant and say, yeah, 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 yeah. But I can't step into this because of, and we fill in the blank with our felt deficiency. At what point in this chapter did it say, oh yeah, it only happened because there were some really efficient human beings. (laughs) It's not there. It's not there. How ridiculous that must seem. So he says. You don't even know what he says. I, I, I don't know, I. I. Let's try it again, ready? Okay, so we've looked forward and we've opened our eyes. But you know what? Something about opening your eyes is you start seeing stuff. Sometimes what God's showing you, he's showing you there's a process. I don't know about you, but we don't really all the time like process. We like the product, right? We like the fruit, but the process sometimes, you know. As, as Jonathan mentioned a little bit ago, um, for a number of years, we lived, we were both teachers at Alaska Bible Institute in Homer, and so, and we lived on each side of a duplex, and, and our, let's, let's face it, oh, he's here again, great. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's face it. Jonathan Walker, the guy has always been in shape. You know? I remember, okay, I remember um, he would always do some of the guys on campus. And we're, we're not next door, so he's always asking me to do stuff. Hey, Steve, I'm going to go lift weights for the guys. Want to come with us? Yeah, and I'm going to read a book. <laughs> hey, Steve, we're going to go. We're going to go surfing like crazy people in the ocean. You want to come join us? Yeah, I'm going to read a book. 
Hey, Steve, we're going to go wrestle mountain goats for fun and drink yak milk. No, he didn't say that one. But there was always something. And I'm thinking, oh, man, look, at he's just fit. Ugh, yeah, it's like, I, I want to be fit. I do. I also want Krispy Kreme. <laughs> I love Krispy Kreme. Um, you know, for some reason, when God says, I'm going to do a new thing, his new thing has yet to make Krispy Kreme into nutritious hold of goodness and health. And it's never been what he's chosen yet. But see, there's a, I might like the product of what I say, I could do that, but I don't like the process. So often when God, we finally, we finally have let go of some of the things we we're holding on to, and we finally started opening our eyes and seeing, God is calling me to, ooh, that doesn't look fun. But there's a walk through this process. But forget all that, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to do, verse 19, for I am about to do something new. <laughs> okay, here we go. You ready? Are you guys bored yet? Okay, you ready to do something? It just means you guys should have full vocal intonation, just ready to go. You ready to go? Okay, you ready? Because if you're not ready, we can give you more time. You are ready. Okay. Yeah. You got to jump in. You've, you've got to jump in. There's that point that our sovereign almighty God lays out a little volitional choice for us. As stewards of this grand portfolio called our lives. I mean, he owns it. We get confused about that sometimes. He owns it. But as stewards, are we going to jump in? He says he's about to to do something new. And look what he does. Look what he does. This verse. Okay. See, I have already begun it. Do not see it. I will. Here he goes. I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry race land. Now let's think back. Remember the story began with them, him reminding them. Do you remember back at the Red Sea? Do you remember how you saw this big body of water? And that water was the barrier that God had to remove. But now they're in captivity. We don't have a little map up here, but basically they are now on the other side of a desert from where they want to get to, from the promised land. They are now at a place where water is no longer a barrier. Now it's inconceivable. The impossibility is how are we going to cross with women, children, elderly, this all of our position. How are we going to cross this vast desert? Water, a necessity of water. He says, Would you, if you're stuck looking back, you're only going to see water as a barrier. He goes, I want to take you to a place in my economy where water is going to be a blessing. You see, that's something that our God does. Things that we look back and we see, this has been a barrier in my life. God says, give it to me. I'm going to make it a blessing. You know, there are so many places we look at these barriers in our life and we keep, we keep giving them credit. We keep giving this barrier this validity or that validity and say, because of this barrier, this can happen. And God says, barrier, I want to make it a blessing. So he says, what? I'm going to give you streams in the desert. He says, I'm going to create rivers. He doesn't say, I'm going to create a little pothole in the ground so you can all let dogs fight over it. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm going to have a little drinking fountain like you do in elementary school. 10 seconds, 10 seconds, because there's not enough to go around. And our God says, for you, rivers in the desert. Water, which was a barrier, is now a blessing. Let me tell you about one of our guys. Kuku Katu Kuku is a guy from Sudan. I got his picture. Next, next one, you might have his picture. Actually, does that, is that video working? I got a little video clip of him talking. Can you try to play that? Okay, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, he's, he shared a little bit of his testimony on there, but that's okay. Let me tell you a little about his story. Um, Muslim tribe in Sudan. But as a young person, he kept getting curious about what he heard a few mountains away. But you see... His name is his family, is his tribe, is his land, is Muslim. And there's not like options there. There's no choices there. Your name says, this is who you are. This is who you fight for. This is who you defend. But as a young person, he would slip out, go a couple of mountains away, and start hearing about Jesus. As he was hearing about Jesus, eventually he came to know Jesus as a Savior. And so he snuck back 
And he told his sister about this Jesus. And so he and his sister started sneaking over the mountains to this other little village. She got saved. So they came back and they told his mom. The mom started going with them. They would sneak over the mountain and hear about Jesus. Then people in his village found out what was going on. Long story of the circumstances, including the man going to that other village, asking who the person was sharing about Jesus, brought him in front of the village and chopped off his head. Cuckoo, katu, cuckoo, and family members had to leave certain areas. And basically, when he came to the Bible school, there was something on his back. It was this, this thing, this barrier that he felt he had. Because no matter where he went, what he did, he had that family name. And that name meant who you are. That name meant you killed this people and this people killed this people. That name was a barrier for him doing anything for the gospel, he felt. Let me tell you something. I was on the phone with Cuckoo about a week and a half ago. Because over the last month or so, his region has now declared they're also an autonomous country, which happens a lot over there. If you get bored, just declare yourself a country. Um, in, the, in the Nuba Mountain region between Sudan and South Sudan. And we're, we're in the process of starting another school up there and just some things there. But here's our problem. The only people who are allowed in this now self-autonomous zone, you have to have a certain last name. You know who heads back next week? Cuckoo Katu Cuckoo. After three years of college in, our, in the Bible school, working out, being heavily discipled, we have two others prepared to go with him. You see, what he saw for all those years as the barrier, God said, is a blessing. You know, as the worship team comes up, I got to challenge us with a couple of things right here tonight. First of all, when, you, when Satan wants to throw something up in your face and say there's a barrier, get a little excited because what are you going to do? You're going to... All of you are going to do it too, right? You're going to... And then you know because you know your God, you know he's doing something somewhere, so it's time to... And then you're going to get a glimpse that this barrier is now a blessing. You're going to get a glimpse of, of this is his next calling on my life. I might not have the warm fuzzies, but it's time to jump in. It's time. But before I pray, Exodus chapter 14. I have to say this because sometimes we get to this moment and we say, yeah, but I'm not ready to jump in yet because I'm, I'm being still and waiting on the Lord. I'm not denying there are certain times for that. But here's my caution on almost every young person we work with. Make sure you're waiting on the Lord. You're not waiting until things feel logical, practical, and warm and fuzzy and call that waiting on the Lord. And I think back to, once again, Red Sea moment. People are terrified. Exodus 14, 13. Moses said to the people, don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. You stand still. The Lord's going to rescue you. You don't have to hold that burden. God's going to do all the work. And I love what, what God says back two verses later. The Lord said to Moses, why are you just crying out to me? Get moving. <laughs> How does God just fine here, standing still and waiting on him? Get moving where he's moving. And what did he say to Moses? You take that staff that I gave you and you raise it up. You take the hands that I gave you. And you, raise, you take what I've already given you. You raise it up and you watch me go. I want to pray as we close out as the worship team leads us here in just one. But I want to pray for all of us. Um, me, our guys across Africa, but every single one of you here. There comes a moment we have to just jump in. And I'm convinced that right now there's some people here who need to be jumping in. There's some things I know I need to be jumping in a little deeper. I'm going to pray for that right now. Let's just stand with me. Let's pray.